Uh, my name is Ian Wallace. Uh, I'm the director of the Cybersecurity Initiative at here at New America. Uh, our program has been going about five years. One of the things I'm most proud about uh, that we do is to provide a platform within DC and indeed across the country for good people to do good things. Uh, and one of the uh, manifestations of that is uh, for the last two years, uh, we have been running a scholar in residence uh, program uh, to provide a home for uh, scholars working in our general area uh, to come and do some writing and uh, produce good work. Uh, our current scholar in residence is Jen Daskal of American University. Uh, and she's working on a book which you will see uh, in, a, in a year or two. Uh, but our first scholar in residence was Alison uh, Sanger, uh, whose book you're about to, to hear about. Uh, and if you want an indication of the benefits of academia and think tanks working together to produce uh, sort of good scholarly work that is uh, in the public interest uh, and, and affects public policy, you, you can't really uh, look for a better example than this. So uh, I'm going to get out of the way. Uh, I want to introduce Amory Slaughter, New America's CEO, someone who's very comfortable at sitting at the intersection of uh, academia and public policy, uh, and let her introduce what is a fantastic panel to discuss this uh, really interesting book. So thank you very much. Uh, well, yes. Okay. We will oh, sorry. Can I yes. one thing? Just to uh, remind you, we are live streaming this and recording this, so this will be available for posterity, uh, and we will be tweeting about it using the hashtag hashtag whistleblowers. Okay. Oh, good. Thank you. Uh, the at, at <laughs> UAM Cyber is an account to look to if you want to see that. Wonderful. So I, we will we'll get started, and that does mean when you are going to ask a question, because we're live streaming, you have to turn on the microphone. The microphone does not help you at the end of the table hear me, but it helps everybody uh, who, who is online. So I've been tweeting about this for uh, a week now, and I, I will ask Allison uh, how on earth she managed to time a book to <laughs> land in the middle of a major whistleblower crisis uh, already being called by at least somebody on my Twitter feed and my email, Ukraine Gate. Uh, but, uh, and we, she can talk about that, but it, it is hard to imagine something more timely uh, and a chance really to hear from people who are in the midst of it. I mean, David Sanger will leave us and rush back to the UN General Assembly uh, probably talking to various uh, people who are directly in it, uh, and we are going to hear from uh, Bunnatine Greenhouse, uh, who will talk about being a whistleblower, uh, and Jamil Jaffer, who's had experience uh, on the Hill and from the national security point of view. So let me introduce each of them briefly, uh, and then I will moderate a conversation, and then we will turn it over uh, to all of you. So Alison Stanger, our author, her book is out today, right? Day one? Uh, day, 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 two, day, one, day two, day two, day two, but just out. Uh, uh, so she, she is the um, Russell Lang 60 Professor of International Politics and Economics at Middlebury. You're, you know, rated in academia by how long the name is in front of your name. Uh, and she there was the founding director of the Rowden Center for International Affairs. Uh, she's the author of this book. She's also the author of a previous book called A Nation Under Contract about the privatization of government through the increased use of contractors. Uh, she, you've heard of her connection here. She's also an external professor at the Santa Fe Institute where she hangs out with physicists and computer scientists. Uh, and she is currently uh, the Technology and Human Values Senior Fellow at Harvard Safra Center for Ethics. So that um, uh, political science, cyber, uh, mathematics, and ethics, all appropriate for uh, whistleblowing. Uh, to my immediate left uh, is David Sanger, whom you all know from the front page of the New York Times, generally in the right-hand column, but occasionally the left. Um, he, he's been a national security uh, correspondent uh, and senior writer in 36 year reporting career for the New York Times. He's been on three teams that have won Pulitzer Prizes, uh, most recently in 2017 uh, for international reporting. 
And his most recent book, highly relevant to today's discussion, is The Perfect Weapon, War, Sabotage, and Fear in the Cyber Age. Uh, and it's a wonderful, and well, wonderful is maybe not the right adjective, but uh, deeply compelling analysis uh, of the, really the differences between cyber conflict and conflict as we've known it. So uh, also uh, the, the kind of cyber dimensions of a lot of this are, are critically important for uh, national security. Uh, to Allison's left, uh, we are delighted to have, uh, can I call you Professor? I can. <laughs> Pro professor Bunnatine Greenhouse, a Bunny Greenhouse. Uh, she is a professor at the Northern Virginia Community College. She's a professor of mathematics. Uh, indeed, she has to leave us to go and teach a class. Uh, she's also a former chief contracting officer uh, from the Senior Executive Service uh, who was responsible for contracting in the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, in two 2005, she testified to a congressional panel. She was a whistleblower. She is a whistleblower. She, she alleged instances of waste, fraud, and abuse. Uh, and sh as she will tell us her story, uh, she had been getting stellar reviews in her job. Once she blew the whistle, a lot of that changed. Uh, and so we will be uh, hearing about that. Uh, she has a uh, degree in engineering from George Washington University and in national resources strategy from the Industrial College of the Armed Forces of the National Defense University, as well as a bachelor's degree in mathematics from Southern University. And on our far left, uh, Jamil Jaffer, uh, geographically. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously not actually on the far left. <laughs> uh, so Jamil is the founder and executive director uh, of the National Security Institute uh, and also the assistant professor of law and director of the National Security Law and Policy Program, that's a mouthful too, uh, at the Antonin Scalia Law School at George Mason University. Uh, so he is also a visiting fellow at, Ho at the Hoover Institution at Stanford. Uh, and Vice President for Strategy and Partnerships at IronNet Cybersecurity. Uh, that would be enough to bring you here, but of particular interest, I think, today is that he served on the leadership team of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee as Chief Counsel and Senior Advisor, and prior to that, Senior Counsel of the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, uh, the kind of committee that receives reports from whistleblowers. Uh, so we are delighted to have uh, this panel, and I'm going to open it up uh, by getting Allison to talk about the book, and then I, we've got specific questions, and then as I said, we'll, we can open it up. We're gonna, the way I'd like to structure it is to talk about whistleblowing generally, and then toward the end, we'll jump into whistleblowing right now, because otherwise we would just discuss the newspaper uh, all morning. All right, so Allison, you started this book five years ago? Seven. Seven. I, I remember reading an early book proposal. So, uh, so, so I do have to, obviously you were not anticipating that in September of 2019, there would be a major whistleblowing scandal. Why did you write the book? What, how, what is it that led you to this subject? Because really even the, I mean, we hear about whistleblowers, but whistleblowing as a subject is not something people write about. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for having me, and thanks to our panelists for joining me on this, on this day. Uh, I wrote the book because, as you mentioned, I wrote this earlier book called One Nation Under the Contract about the privatization of government. And in that book, Can I you hear in the back? Can you hear okay. me okay? Yeah. yeah. In that book, I noticed how the line between business and government was increasingly becoming blurred. And we all know about the revolving door as contractors became increasingly involved in, in, in our foreign policy. And so that struck me as a real problem because I realized business exists for different things than government. You know, government is supposed to uphold the common good. Business has to be attentive to a bottom line. So what happens when you mix that up and that line is blurred? You can get some unintended consequences. And I, I go through those in the book. And that's what led me to the question that took me to whistleblowers is I thought, we are trusting our elites with so much push. I'm echoing, so that's why I'm hesitating moment, momentarily. How do we keep our elites honest in that context? You know, how do we provide some degree of oversight? And that's how I came to the topic of whistleblowers, because 
that's effectively what whistleblowers do. They help keep our elites honest. I would argue they're the lifeblood of democracy and they expose misconduct that the public should know about. So they're not just leakers. A leaker is not necessarily a whistleblower. Uh, you have to really be exposing some sort of wrongdoing and usually the, the, the person who's exposed is embarrassed and ashamed about it, wants to keep it hidden. That might strike us a little strange in the current situation, but um, in my book, which is an episodic history of whistleblowing in America, that is the reaction you typically see is some degree of shame when, when the matter is brought to light. Not necessarily the case in our current uh, political uh, battle. So the thing I'd like to stress for you is, is that if you look at the history of whistleblowing in America, it really illuminates the current conflict in a very important way and shows you that this is not a partisan issue. Yeah. What's taking place right now is really something that's just the tip of an iceberg. And in my book, I chronicle the extraordinary way the intelligence community has been, been behaving in recent years under the Trump administration, but also the extraordinary way in which the, the White House is behaving given currently current national security norms. So I think my book illustrates how the intelligence community has been violating their norms and even the law by leaking classified information because they're concerned about the system itself. They are concerned that the president of the United States is not upholding his oath to preserve, protect, and defend the constitution of the United States, which both intelligence community employees and the president swear the same oath. So that's what's really at stake here. And it's very easy to look at this and say, this is, this is a partisan issue. And, and obviously you're hearing a lot of that. It really isn't a partisan issue if our system itself is at stake. And so I think by looking at the history of whistleblowing America, you can see that this is something that is very unusual, the situation. We obviously don't want it to continue. We don't want a whistleblowing intelligence community, uh, a leaking intelligence community. Uh, we don't want. We don't? <laughs> yeah, you might want a leaking. You might want a leaking one. <laughs> we, I was sort of confused by that. Yeah, we don't. We don't. No, no. Yeah, we don't want a. Uh, we also don't want a, a president who's violating all the norms of foreign policy, and it's you know, our best aspiration should be to return things to normal as soon as possible. But in order to do that, you've got to acknowledge that this is not politics as usual. This is not a normal situation and it needs to be put right. And thankfully, I think a whistleblower, this most recent whistleblower has really shown a light on some very important issues for American democracy. Can one I, more, one more thing. I, no, please. Oh, one more thing I just wanted to say is and you can read about it in the Atlanta today if you're interested. Whistleblowing is really in America's DNA. We, we, we had the first whistleblower protection law and it predates our constitution. It was uh, promulgated in 1778 in response to corruption of the first Commodore of the US Navy, Essex Hopkins, who was essentially defying George Washington's orders to engage the British in the, in, in the Revolutionary, Revolutionary War in order to serve his own economic interests. And what were his economic interests? Well, he was involved in the slave trade as were most Rhode Island elites, which is where he came from. And so uh, Congress responded, they removed him from office, they protected the whistleblowers, they paid their legal fees, they insisted that all the information be made available to the public. And that's the reason we know about this story today. Many countries around the world have looked to the United States for leadership on this issue and it's nice, in my view, to see us returning to it, not just because of my book, but because of I care about my country. So I want to I want to push a little on on what I think is the audacity of the claim you're making, because you and then and no. make sure I get it right. You are really saying that the ability to blow the whistle <laughs> and to be protected if you blow the, the yeah. whistle is essential to our democracy. You are saying it's a pillar of democracy because it gives rise to a sort of a system of mutual accountability mm -hmm. among 
government peers, but also up and down. Like you can blow the whistle on somebody above you, you can blow the whistle on somebody who's who's in the same place. But you are you're not saying it's sort of a a nice to have. You're saying it's a need to have. Is that is that right? Yes, and I don't mean to oversimplify this because obviously the na national security whistleblowing is the most difficult because in order to blow the whistle, you've got to essentially violate the law to do so for a higher cause. And even though there are inspector generals that are supposed to protect whistleblowers, when you look at the law, the Whistleblower Protection Enhancement Act of 1989 and 2012, explicitly excludes all national security employees. So if you're looking for a good reform issue for Congress, this is one. To try to work out some way together that we can navigate that space because you need to keep classified information to run a uh, effective foreign policy. Right. So we will definitely have yeah. reactions on That's the national true. security yeah. side, but let me talk, let me turn to Bunny and, and and ask you to talk about your experience as a whistleblower, at least from the way Allison describes your case in her book, you were not protected. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I'd love to hear from you sort of the chilling effect of that uh, in terms of your own career, but also those who work with you and what that means if you're not protected. Yes. I am Bunny Greenhouse and I am a whistleblower. <laughs> <laughs> I did not like that term when it was first introduced to me by my attorney. I said, I'm not a whistleblower. You know, I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm absolutely trying to do my job. I was brought to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers by its new commander to revolutionize contracting, uh -huh. you know, at the Corps. It had been an old boys net network for over a hundred years where uh, contracting, the, the contractors who were selected for jobs was not necessarily on their expertise and the uh, <laughs> and how they were going to save money for our government and so on. It was on uh, oftentimes the military and some of the civilians that were in government. Uh, if they the military did not make a general officer, uh, they knew that this revolving door would bring them greater jobs when they got on the outside. And so they wanted that to stop. And so they brought me in. I took an oath of office that I would conduct the business of contracting with the highest degree of, of integrity, ethics, uh, with beyond reproach, and with prefer preferential treatment toward none. And that preferential treatment toward none was what brought me to the forefront in 2003 during the Iraq war. Uh, whereas I found out later that it had already been decided that Halliburton was going to be and KBR were going to be the contractors for whatever they had decided was going to happen in the uh, Iraq war. Things that never materialized. And, um, and so when I found that out, uh, it was really after uh, I had gone forward with finding those um, uh, conflicts of interest. Uh, KBR had written the contingency plan, which is like an economic analysis. So they had defined what was going to go on to, uh, to settle the destruction, you know, that may have gone on uh, with the uh, oil fields. And they had written the budget and everything that was going to happen. So actually they had written their own contract and uh, decided the money that they were going to get. And the Army and Defense and uh, uh, the Corps of Engineers had decided that it was going to be classified. And if it's going to be non-competitive, as you hear the no-bid contracts, it was going to be competitive, non-competitive. And it was going to be awarded for five years. Wow. I was the competition advocate. I was looking out for small businesses and every and fairness in the business of contracting. And no way was that going to happen without my writing my reservations. So it happened that when the acquisition plan came to me and the final contract, they had the five years on there. Um, and so after I had protested so much, when the final document hit my desk, it had a two-year option, two years base and three-year options. 
but knowing the environment, those options never would have been uh, looked into and evaluated. So I decided to write above my signature what my reservations were. And so that then branded me as a whistleblower. Uh, knowing that most people who are branded as whistleblowers, they try to go to their internal, to their up their chain of command first and let them know the, the law and what we are up against. Because I was the only one as the principal assistant responsible for contracting who could go to prison for those billions of dollars that I was about to award. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the legal people couldn't go. Uh, and no one else, none of the general officers that were there, they would say, well, she never told us anything. And we were military, so we didn't know what we were doing and she was the cause. In fact, that was the first remedy they offered me. They brought me in and said, we won't take your uh, SES rank. We won't take your one-star general protocol. We won't take your top secret clearance if you will leave now. And I'm saying, leaving now for what? I'm just doing my job. If you will leave now. But the whole thing was to use me as a scapegoat, to say she never told us anything. We were military, so we were just doing the things that we thought we knew what to do. So it was a very, um, a, it was, I, I thank God in a sense for being chosen, you know, for this. I didn't know when I came in and took the oath of office that I took that, I was going to have to stand up for the things that I believed in. Remember, whistleblowers come into organizations with values. They have values from their roots. And I had values from my roots, even from the point of not telling white lies. My mother introduced that to me with a switch. <laughs> Just say that in Louisiana, in, 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 her, in their house, if you told a white lie, you were going you had to go out and determine your switch you know for the punishment <laughs> and my mother explained to me that a, a white lie was an intentional it was an intentional way of deceiving someone and so uh i learned from then so uh, i remember many times in the corps of engineers that they didn't trust me because they never knew what i was going to say uh in our meetings um they would have times when they were roasting people in a sense, I guess you'd call it. And so when I knew, when I knew what the, uh, the situation was, I would bring some clarity to it. So then I was told, can't trust her, you know, because you never know what she's gonna, because I was destroying their roasting, you know, of a person. Nobody would ever do it for me, but still I could not sit there and know something and not explain or bring some clarity about it. So I became the skunk in the park. And literally, that's the way I was treated. I was moved out of my office, um, a, a very nice office over there, and put in a cubicle um, where I was totally out of uh, any kind of management uh, uh, decision making and so on, especially with contracting. And they had placed the military colonel in as the the acting principal assistant resp uh, responsible for contracting who was not prepared. At that time that they moved me out of my office, Katrina came along. I'm from Louisiana when very much I was needed to be there to help make those decisions. But can you believe Halliburton was the one who got most of the contracts to help prepare the way of getting uh, New Orleans and Katrina back into the right. So being a, whistle, a whistle, whistleblower is not easy. It is a loyalty to the truth. And it's, uh, it's, it's um, truth without fear. I was brought up in my life, you know, not to fear to bring forth what it is that I knew and I could contribute without any reservations, without any regard to what it was going to do for me. So whistleblowing is a sacrifice of self and your ideals and the things that you know that it's not going to come to a good end for your personal goals. But what are you going to do? You've got to stand in front of the mirror the next day and that night and say, what did I do in my work today? 
So it only takes one person to change and make a difference in an organization by just doing the right thing because you know it's the right thing to do regardless of the consequences. And that had been my life, regardless of the con consequences. You know, giving aside self, sacrificing self for truth. What better goal is that? When you know the truth and you know it's gonna be for the best interest of the public. And that's what my, my whole thing was. I believe that integrity in government is not an option, that it's an obligation. And there are not many people who will stand up for that, you know, these days. There are not many people who don't believe that there are alternative truths. <laughs> Indeed. Truth, <laughs> truth is truth. And let's get to explaining that truth. And when it comes to that much money that I was in charge of, and overseeing, I was not going to have my grandchildren read about me going to prison, you know, for abuse or, or in, in government contracting. So, you, so I made a choice. And, and we are grateful. Um, it is, mm -hmm. you, you underline a couple of, of points. Uh, I mean, one, I think where you start, where you say, you know, you, you didn't want to be a whistleblower. It's, no. not, it's not a word that people, uh, apply to it themselves eagerly, um, but you also point out that it is a government under law and you were under law and part yes. of your response was because th that, that accountability would land on you if you didn't raise it. Right, and I remember uh, Secretary Rumsfeld saying that at the same time the Air Force was having a problem, um, Darlene Drillian, you know, was the person there then, and I believe she went to prison for about nine months, you know, for yeah, some yeah. activities that went on there. And I remember reading in the paper that Secretary Rumsfeld said that the Air Force did not have any adult su supervision. <laughs> I was trying to be that adult supervision. <laughs> and where, where I was so disappointed that instead of uh, the administration saying, well, Bunny Greenhouse is doing the right thing, you know, to bring to, for, to the forefront those uh, conflicts of interest, because once you do a contingency plan or an economic analysis, you don't follow through doing the follow-on contracting. Right. You know, because you have excluded yourself, you know, from that, unless we can mitigate, you know, that conflict, of, those conflicts of interest. And I had to bring those things to the forefront and let them know that, uh, so in the final analysis, it came out with, um, because I wrote what I wrote on the contract um, and really was sending it up to the Department of the Army because they had the final word, you know, and they were the executive agent, you know, for the, the contract. Uh, I thought that they would have called me to say, what are you talking about? What do you want us to do about this? But nobody did. I was just stuck in the park and I was thinking all over and nobody wanted to sit beside me. So therefore it went forth, you know, as it was, but because I had raised that, it forced them to go into a competition hmm. within a year's time, within the year's time. Even though they call me from Texas and say, why are you coming out here? What role do you think you're gonna play? I was still the principal assistant responsible for contracting and I was gonna be there to see what was the conduct of that business as long as it was on my watch. Thank you. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so David, let me come to you uh, on the first place. that We're now in the national security sphere, certainly, uh, Bunny, your story, uh, and Allison raised that. Um, and you joked where you said, you know, is there a difference? She said, we want whistleblowers, we don't want leakers. You said, you know, why? Let me ask you, do you make any distinction? They're all sources, right? From where you sit, they start with sources. Do you make any distinction between somebody who you think is leaking, maybe to hurt a rival, all the different reasons people leak, and somebody who is trying to uphold what they think needs to be done? That's a great question. Um, and uh, so first of all, congratulations to Allison. I mean, Anybody here, anybody can write a book. You know, I've written a few, and Marie's written a few. Mm -hmm. uh, Alice has written 
uh, some before, but no one else I know can write a book and then arrange for a whistleblower crisis in the middle of it. <laughs> and anyone at this table who thinks that's coincidental, <laughs> you don't know Allison, okay? <laughs> okay. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm fully in the conspiracy theory mode here <laughs> of how it is that the first whistleblower scandal who engaged the President of the United States in 50 years happens to happen on the week that Allison's book, <laughs> book comes, comes out. out. Yeah. I mean, as they tell you in journalism school, if it doesn't look like a coincidence, it probably isn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, it's a really good question, Emery. And, and you and I have talked about this over the years. And we had differences of opinion, which we can replay if anybody wants them, about WikiLeaks and yes. our decisions to go, to go publish that. And that's covered in, in the book as well, uh, in a really interesting piece of it. So my, here's a framework in which I would put it. Um, the whistleblower protection, as Allison said, goes back deep in our history. And it goes back because people recognize there has to be a venting system to bring sunshine into government. I would say that the Whistleblower Protection Act and those that went before it are just one piece of the ways that that happens. And the overall architecture of how that happens is called the First Amendment, right? And um, as uh, Bill Keller, a former executive editor uh, of the Times used to say and was executive editor during the WikiLeaks discussions that were going on, oh, wow. there is a reason the First Amendment is first. <laughs> that too was not a coincidence. Okay. So within that structure, what does that mean? As we have come to interpret the First Amendment since the Pentagon Papers, which was a really interesting moment in leakage rather than whistleblowing, right? As we've come to interpret it, the government of the United States does not have the authority to go to any publication, the New York Times, the Washington Post, a blogger, CNN, and say you are prohibited from publishing X piece of information. And even this whistleblower event that we've seen unfold at rapid speed in the past week has unfolded in rapid speed only because we had members of Congress at first leaking and then saying publicly, something strange here, we were supposed to get a whistleblower account, it didn't happen, it didn't get delivered, we were told it was being blocked. So they're leaking the very, about whistleblowers. They were leaking, right, <laughs> they were leaking about whistleblowers. And that is a critical fact, because none of what you've seen happen, including this morning's release of the transcript, would have happened without the intense journalistic pressure that was put on this government to go do it. If they had kept it all within the channel, they would have been in a long struggle with Congress the transcript would have been turned over. It would have been required to be kept confidential, right? And the view of people who work in journalism in the United States, or many people who work in journalism, and certainly in this city, is some issues of national security are far, far too important to entrust to the government of the United States, wow. right? Okay? Mm -hmm. And and that you that you start off by entrusting it to our system. Now, if you are a member of the government and you are concerned about the leakage of classified data, which is a real concern, and I'll, we can go into how we, we deal with that, then your view is somewhat different. You flip it on its edge and you say, who elected you to go decide what should be published and what shouldn't be published, right? And that's the most frequent th line that you get in that um, dance, which used to happen to me infrequently and now happens very frequently, when you go to the government and you say, we are preparing to publish a story on X, and we're here to discuss with you your, your national security concerns so that we can make a judgment about what? what might actually be damaging to national security. But the judgment is entirely ours. You can express your concerns. We did this with your colleagues in the State Department during WikiLeaks. But at the end of the day, the only one with authority to make the decision is us. Now, government officials hate hearing that. And they usually come back and say, who elected you? 
and we say, well, you know, you're really going to have to take this up with James Madison and, and others. <laughs> and we realize that's a difficult conversation to have these days, um, but that's the core of it. Now, the whistleblower protection was created so that people were not stuck in the awful choice between coming to the New York Times or the Washington Post or the Wall Street Journal or someone else and sitting there without, without any other recourse. So Bunny made a really hard choice, okay? And the hard choice she made, she didn't want to become a whistleblower, but she decided to go in and follow the process. She could have made another choice. Instead of being called a whistleblower, she could have been called something she would have disliked even more, to be called a leaker, go to a reporter and say, hey, Halliburton is being given a sweetheart deal here, and we are being told not to go do this. Now, by sticking within the system, as we just heard, she paid a price, pretty big price. If you had come to us, you would have paid probably an even bigger price because then there would have been a charge of, of an effort that they could prosecute you for violating something that was classified. It's our overall view, Anne-Marie, that just because something is classified is not necessarily even a brief reason not to go publish it because things are wildly overclassified, as that you know. I do. Okay. When WikiLeaks came out, not to replay our old argument, um, <laughs> Uh, one day I was asked by a very senior person uh, in your building to come by right after WikiLeaks happened and just explain how this happened. So I gathered up a bunch of the WikiLeaks documents, which you'll recall the ones we were publishing were the State Department cables. They were at the lowest level of classification, but they were classified. And I walked them over to your building and I sat down with this official and I said, um, I would guess between 15 and 20% of the documents we went through in the 250,000 cables were newspaper articles that had appeared in China or Portugal or Britain or someplace that somebody thought somebody ought to read in Washington. And so they put it into the cable system and they stamped secret on it and pushed it on through even though you could Google it that day. And my question to this official, which has never been answered by subsequent officials as well, is how are we supposed to respect a system that would classify an article that was published yesterday in the Times of London or the China Daily News or whatever? And the answer I got back was, well, nobody's ever gotten fired for overclassifying. Lots of people have gotten fired for underclassifying. Right. So the incentive in the system is to classify everything. Now let's spin it forward to this morning. If you haven't read it yet, go back and read the, it's not really a transcript, but the summary of the president's discussion with the president of Ukraine. And ask yourself, because you'll see struck out on it last night was secret, no foreign, meaning not for foreign dissemination, low level, level of classification, almost exactly what was in the WikiLeaks stuff. Then ask yourself the question, what is it in this document that required it to be classified to begin with? And the answer is absolutely nothing, except that you discover that the President of the United States is asking the President, the newly elected uh, leader of another country to go launch an investigation against the man he thinks was going to run against him for president of the United States. Everything else in it is niceties. Don't we get along together? Nothing. You haven't heard similar things in public speeches. And that's the dilemma we face when it comes on the whistleblowing side. So yes, sometimes we get sources who are self-interested. Sometimes we get sources who like Bunny uh, have discovered a real piece of wrongdoing but don't believe the system will react for them. Right. Okay. Sometimes we get sources who are out to do no good. And we are certainly trying to figure out what the motivations of our sources are. And we're frequently wrong in that. But you judge it by the importance of the information, not by the stamp that somebody put on it. All right. 
So let me come to you, Jamila, to talk to talk about this from the from congressional perspective. And part part of it, I, I would love to have your reflection on the leaker whistleblower distinction uh, in terms of, uh, so one way to think about it is, yes, that leakers are endangering the government from the government's point of view. Whistleblowers are from the point of view, as, as the way Allison puts it, uh, are uh, holding the government to the standards we should be held by. So I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on that. But I'd also, to the extent you've seen whistleblower complaints that come through the proper channels, how do you try to distinguish between the disgruntled employee, right? That's always the first thing the management says. Oh no, you know, the, the, this didn't happen. This employee got a bad performance review and doesn't like it. So how do you, how do you then think about and sure. evaluate the actual content of the, of the whistleblowing complaint? Look, I mean, it's a really, it's a really important point um, and really important questions, particularly as we're as we're debating this in public uh, with the most recent whistleblower issue. Um, I think there's a critically important distinction between a leaker and a whistleblower. And while David may love leakers, um, the reality is that leakers are violating the law, and whistleblowers aren't. Right? Let's just take the sort of paradigmatic leaker who some a lot of people call a whistleblower, right? Edward Snowden, <laughs> and let's take Bunny. Right? Edward Snowden released a tremendous amount of class, highly classified information, some of which arguably created a very a very healthy public debate and led to actual legislation, so we can argue about that, right? But the bulk, 99% of whatever Snowden released, had nothing to do with the public debate, had no impact on American privacy and civil liberties, but was simply details about how the NSA and other government agencies conduct surveillance of foreign officials and foreign entities, and in many ways, out of those capabilities to our worst enemies. Edward Snowden, who released this information through the press, through the free press, uh, um, although through the foreign press also, uh, ran. He didn't like Bunny, sign his name to a document, put his concerns in public, tell his bosses, tell the inspector general, go through the process, go to the congressional committees. He didn't do any of the things Bunny did. To the contrary, he ran. He ran to Russia, where he lives today or the protection of Vladimir Putin, who anybody, I think, anybody but maybe the president can, can agree is a, is a inveterate opponent of the United States, our, our foreign policy and our interests in the world. Um, and so that's, that's a leaker, right? Now we can argue about Daniel Ellsworth, a lot of other leakers, we can debate the merits and the upside, but Edward Snowden to me is the case in point of a person who by the law, who ran and didn't stand and face punishment. Daniel Ellsworth, his credit, didn't run off to Russia, didn't run off anywhere. Daniel Ellsworth stayed and faced the music. Bunny put her complaints in writing. She followed the law. And, and you, we can all debate what the merits of the whistleblowing were, whatever, right? But what can't be disputed is Edward Snowden and Bunny are two very different people. David might write both stories, right? But there's a difference. And we've also changed the way we think about journalistic ethics. things. I think David is right. Look, ultimately, the newspapers are making the judgment call about whether to publish or not. And if you remember, you go back to the terror surveillance program that was outed in 2005 uh, by the New York Times, right? In a, in a hotly debated issue between the Bush administration and the New York Times. They had that story for years. They held that story for the better part of a year, maybe a year and a half. For in, national security reasons. For national security reasons. At the for request. what the government told us were national security meetings so, reasons at the time. Okay. Different, going, different distinctions. All right. With, going, with the government said national security reasons and which the, which the paper respected. The editorial board sat and discussed it and held back for a year and a half. And they even released it over the objections of the administration. The administration wanted it kept, kept secret even at that point. And we could debate about whether the, whether the objections were real and whether it had a measurable impact on, 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 uh, on our surveillance capabilities and the like. Um, but what is clear is there has been a long history of dialogue between the press and the government about what is classified, what's not, whether it's properly classified, whether it's overclassified or not. And I, I agree, I agree with David that, um, there is a tremendous amount of overclassification. That's a problem. That shouldn't be a justification for leaking. It should be a justification for violating the law. It's a, it's a justification for changing the way we do classification and not overclassifying. Um, but I think at the, in the final analysis, the reason we have these whistleblower protection laws and the reason we have a, what I agree with, uh, with Allison is a very long history of protecting uh, people who out government waste, fraud, and abuse um, and allow Congress to get involved in that process is because that is at the core of our values. 
And that's an important value, just as a free press is. What's also the core values is respecting decisions by the government to properly classify, properly classify information. Government needs to have secrets. That's okay. Uh, it has been true also since the, since the dawn of our, of our modern American government. Um, and the question where that tension plays out and the, more, the, the, the sort of the moral compass of the press and when they make those judgments and how they make those judgments, in a lot of ways, the way the press has changed with the, with the evolution of the blogosphere and Twitter and, and the president's use of Twitter, it has changed the way we think about journalism. And let's be clear, Julian Assange is not a journalist by any stretch of the imagination. He's not. The idea somehow that the whistleblower protection laws or our First Amendment ought to apply to Julian Assange is ridiculous. We can debate that issue. Uh, we can debate whether people should have published his, 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 his materials. Um, but, you know, these are important. It's good that we're having this conversation. And it's good that Allison's book is out today. I mean, if any, if there's a producer or a booker out there who hasn't looked at this book or hasn't picked it up yet, go get it. Have her on your show. I mean, this is, I mean, you know, this is the idea you can put up on the screen and say, look, we've got a book right about this thing right now about the history of this uh, in, in the middle of a whistleblower scandal. Um, but, uh, and, and I think Allison's right, and David's right, that uh, but for this whistleblower, we might have not heard about this issue for a long time. Not clear that that wouldn't have led to the right results, right? In Bunny's case, there was an investigation. There was a debate. We fought over these issues without it getting out, leaked out publicly, without it being, that classified information being revealed in the, in the, in the press immediately. Um, the debate may not come out the way anybody wanted it to, or, or you know, there, may have been, there may have been challenges as a result, but the debate was had in Congress, um, and now we're going to see, by the way, by the way, it's, it's worth noting, and I'll, and I'll stop here, that a Republican-led Senate, Mitch McConnell, right, who people have, you know, uh, derisively referred to as Moscow Mitch, is the one who hotlined to the floor resolution last night, require, instructed the president to deliver to the Congress a full copy of the whistleblower complaint. That's astounding if you think about it. Hotlined it to the floor. He didn't have to do that. He could have fought it. He could have tried to stave it off. He's done that in a number of other issues, right? He didn't. He hotlined the floor. And that demonstrates that there is a strong set of those values in the government, on the Hill, in the administration. Yeah, and, and again, I, I know there's a lot of concern about the president. I've expressed them myself. But he did put that, he did put that transcript or the, the summary out there. And now he's going to, we're going we're gonna to have it out. We're going to have that debate about whether pages two and three of that thing, right, where, the, where Zelensky says, I want to buy javelin. And the president says, yeah, yeah, javelins, though, you know, we're about to have this other thing. And so we're going we're gonna to learn. The public's going to have a chance. The Congress going to have a chance to debate. Is that a quid pro quo? Right? What was going on there? You know, all like right. whistleblower wouldn't be there. So we're going to hold that for a second. I'm going to let, I'm going to turn to all of you soon to let you ask your questions. But I want to come back to Allison. The, so let's assume we're talking about real whistle, whistleblowers, uh, bunny greenhouse whistleblowers. Your argument is that from the very beginning, we, we the United States, have protected whistleblowers because we've recognized that this is a critical way of holding ourselves accountable, of, of, of blowing the whistle on elite misbehavior or government misbehavior. Not always the same thing. Um, but how many whistleblowers have actually been protected? Because, I mean, Bunny's story is not a story of being protected. It's a story of being basically hounded out of office. So you're, you've reviewed all these different whistleblowers. Is, do we talk about whistleblower protection or do we actually protect whistleblowers? That's, that's the question. I'm glad you're asking it because even though we have this tradition, we also behave hypocritically. I call it in my book, The Paradox of Whistleblowing in America, in that we celebrate whistleblowing. I thought it was so interesting in the Snowden debate that some of the biggest uh, uh, disagreements were over whether Snowden could really be called a whistleblower or not. And that's perhaps why Mitch McConnell did what he did, because we, we believe in whistleblowers in theory. In practice, it's another matter. You know, when the dust clears, they're often punished. They lose everything, they sacrifice enormously. And in fact, I can't even think of an example in the government realm where that is not the case. <laughs> so, so let's think a little bit about how we wanna do better in the future. Yeah, Bunny, go not ahead. One, there's not, not one general whistleblower law. It differs yes. for the different communities. Exactly. And the ones in the intelligence community, they have a very limited, way that they can disclose you know anything and if someone like the inspector general 
uh, become silent or compromised, that puts a chill on the rest of the people in that community as to whether they are going to come forth. I can just briefly take on one issue that uh, my friend Jamal raised, which has to do with Snowden, who I would never go out to go defend for a moment. And you're absolutely right. The difference between uh, him and Daniel Ellsberg is Ellsberg stayed around. In the end, he didn't have to suffer a, a, a penalty, uh, but that wasn't clear at the time. We stick around. Uh, I've been through a lot of leak investigations. Um, most notably out of the revelation of Olympic Games, which was the U.S. Uh, cyber program against Iran, but that's not the only one. And I'm blessed in that I've got a whole New York Times legal department behind me that says to the U.S. government, you want to go do this one in court? Bring, Bring it on, it. guys. Right. This, is what, this is what the lawyers of the New York Times, this is why they're not making more money someplace else. It's because they want to take on these kind of cases and bless them because that's how you go create new law here. But one thing you said about Snowden, Snowden justified what he did on the basis that the United States was violating privacy in ways that I didn't find terribly persuasive. But his doc, what the documents he released, while many of them I'm sure did reveal US techniques, operations and so forth, also triggered some pretty fundamental debates, yeah. right? Um, why was the NSA on autopilot listening into Angela Merkel's cell phone? Something that the president reversed as soon as he read about it. Uh, okay. Reversed-ish. We should talk. We should talk about that. Okay. We should debate okay. the surveillance Angela Merkel's cell phone. That's a great. But, that, but it's a real. It's an interesting one. Um, the NSA had been collecting but not looking at call records, not the actual content of the call, but call records of every phone call everybody in this room made domestically and overseas so that they could go into that later on. Now, what we learned later was they had considered ending the program because it was a waste of money and they weren't getting very debate much over out that. of it, right? But there was an effort even within the NSA to kill it off before this happened. But after it was revealed, the president no longer authorized that, and they came up with an alternative means by which um, the, the telephone providers are collecting the material and the NSA Russian can go in and, and, and get it. So they brought, he brought about change. So it's entirely possible that you could have violated your oath, um, conducted criminal activity, and actually gotten something done. Yeah, I mean, look, nobody, nobody, nobody can debate that sometimes, you know, leakers, uh, the results of leaking result in, in positive change or positive debate or, or the political process moving forward. The question is really whether all the stuff, and remember, the one, there's one document that was so revealed that led to that program, right? It was that, that Verizon business order. That's right? right. Bulk telephone order. What about the other hundreds of thousands of pages that had nothing to do with Americans, nothing to do with our private civil liberties, nothing to do with our rights under the Constitution, right, that he revealed, that revealed not only who was targeted for American surveillance, but our capabilities, detailed technical discussions of our capabilities. None of that's part of the public debate. Everyone wants to talk about Edward Snowden as a whistleblower, wants to talk about the business records thing. We can have that debate, right? right. But let's talk about what the, the traitorous nature of Edward Snowden's behavior, and I say it advisedly when I say Edward Snowden is no question in my mind, a traitor who should be prosecuted. Both, okay. both, were, both were in the content, both, both were in were the true. material, right. which, yeah. which is what makes it such a fascinating case, right. because advocates on both sides can actually find Fair. something in that. Can, it, can you say one thing about, 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 about yes, yes, and then now about, about this, about this, uh, this, um, everybody this issue of, uh, of Angela Merkel, right, because since you raised it. Um, <laughs> listen, if we are not, if the NSA and the CIA and all of our intelligence agencies are not listening to Angela Merkel's phone calls and every other foreign leader allied or not, fire them all. Huh? Other, other than those who are, other than those who we made an agreement with to not do that, like the UK allegedly, right? We, we should just shut it down. I mean, this is literally the job. We want to know what our, what our allies and our enemies are thinking, why they're thinking that, and what we can do to elevate our interests. That is literally the goal of our nation and the goal of our intelligence community. If we're not doing that, then we're doing something wrong. So of course we have Angela Merkel on collection. We should have, we should never have limited that. 
We should not end that. The president, by the way, to, the, for the, for the, to be clear, you know, put in place a certain set of procedures, as Anne-Marie will tell you, about what we would do when we did those. He did not end surveillance of foreign leaders. No, he, en he ended the surveillance of that foreign leader on that phone. Well, all right, because he yeah, got caught, right? right? I mean, let's just call it what it right. is, right? I mean, look, um, uh, and, and on the phone records program, we continued the phone records program until Congress changed it and then kept a, pro a, a version of the phone records program going until the present day, which is now going to be debated in Congress. So, look, I, I, yes, these are issues of imp import that, that should, can and should be discussed, right? but in the right way, right? That's why we have a process, right? It's not about running to the press and then running to Moscow, right? If that's the plan, then right. we've got real problems. Yeah. All right, so Allison, uh, I will just say, I, I was in Germany with a group of Germans uh, when uh, a very senior CIA official made that argument. Of course, we should be listening to your chancellor's cell phone. It did not go over well. Yeah. That was not the view <laughs> of you know, our allies. You know what's funny about the Germans is? So the Germans are actually the biggest beneficiaries of the 215 metadata program. Then anyone else, we've stopped more terrorist attacks in Germany than anywhere else in the world in that program. They came out publicly and pilloried it. Two weeks later, they were at NSA. The BND was meeting with General Keith Alexander saying, please keep the program alive. We need the data. Our politicians are out there yapping, yapping, yapping. We need the data. <laughs> okay. So, Allison, last word, and I'll just Just up. very quickly about the process, because I'm a process per person. I make an argument in the book that we need to restore process. We need to return to normal. What's going on right now is not an admirable state of affairs. But let's face the facts here. You want to stay, stick around and uh, face the music, you may suffer like Bunny did, because what she left out of her story is whistleblower protection didn't protect her. You finally, you finally had to file a Title VII discrimination Absolutely. suit, and that's what finally resolved it. With the case of Snowden, people say, why didn't you just complain up the, up, the, up the chain? Well, there you have to realize that NSA uh, uh, Inspector General George Lard was removed from his post in 2016 for retaliating against a whistleblower. So I think it's pretty fair to say that if he had gone inside and not done what he did, we wouldn't know these things. And he was a contractor, so he wouldn't have been covered. Yeah, that's, yeah. A, that's a whole legal question too, right. because of his contractor status. So, so we've got a long way to go with whistleblower protection. Okay, floor is open. Just introduce yourself and make sure you turn on your green screen right here. Uh, Mike Nelson, I was a professor of internet studies at Georgetown, and so I wanted to talk a bit about the power of technology, and not just for the the big cases, but for the more fine-grained cases. Um, it seems that the internet culture is encouraging people to expose little incidents. There's a famous website in India called ipaidabribe.com. Oh, yeah. More than 100,000 people have reported a policeman or an official who asked for a bribe to excuse a speeding ticket or to get a passport. And it does seem that the social media ethos is encouraging more whistleblowing. 15 years ago, it was the famous dog poop girl in the South Korean subway where someone took a picture of this woman who didn't clean up after her dog and suddenly the whole world knew about this. I'd be interested in hearing your, your thoughts and or any of your thoughts on how the social media paparazzi culture is actually encouraging more whistleblowing at the local, you know, small incident level. Yeah. Who wants to? I, I would just say really briefly that I'm not sure the example you cite is an example of a whistleblower because that's a shaming, social shaming sort of thing. And we do see a lot of that on social media, I think, with a lot of negative consequences. You know, but if you're breaking the law, let's assume there's a dog poop law, right? <laughs> Was there? <laughs> I, I'm gonna assume there is. But, but I think it does raise the question of, you know, what is social monitoring, where we're all monitoring each other all the time and saying, oop, you know, you parked illegally or you, whatever the, the ways in which many of us break the law, in small yeah. ways all yeah. the time versus whistleblowing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, that does seem to me. Uh, I call it but, mutually assur assured disclosure. Yes. Yeah. So you can take a picture of, of the House of Representatives in his car, the member of the Represent House of Representatives speeding down yes. uh, I-66. For, for this reason, I really root my definition of whistleblowing in the rule of law yeah. uh, and, and 
that's important to do because otherwise it could expand to be anything you want it to be. But a level, I mean, is it like felonies <laughs> rather than misdemeanors? No, just illegality or misconduct violation of norms, constitutional norms in the-, in the But then that would be whistleblowing because if it's illegal, cleaning up- Not in the, it's not a gov government, oh, I government see. issue. I see. I don't know. Oh. I don't know enough about the particular case, but I guess the point I'm trying to make is that we don't want whistleblowing to be in the eye of the beholder. In other words, just because you think something is corrupt and immoral doesn't necessarily mean it is corrupt and immoral. Whistleblowing is not about differences in policy. You don't get the, you don't blow the whistle if you leak something because you disagree with a particular policy. Whistleblowers expose misconduct. They expose corruption. They expose the exploitation of uh, public office for private gain. Okay, so it's important. Which, which is why the transcript is sort of the classic case, isn't it? In my view, yes. Well, also, also why Edward Snowden isn't a whistleblower. He wasn't. He wasn't exposing Allow corruption. Me. He wasn't exposing um, uh, people acting for private gain. He was exposing what he thought, in his opinion, was illegal activity. As it turns out, by the way, not only was it not illegal, Congress reauthorized a version of that very program. Every court to have ever looked at. The claim that Snowden made about privacy and liberty, every court, and there were dozens of them, and every judge, and there were dozens of them, had held that the activity that Edward Snowden revealed was lawful. So, so that, actually, that actually isn't true, because the U.S. Court of Appeals overturned, and Congress responded and revised the Patriot Act. No, so to be to be so to be clear, every judge to the point of the disclosure, right, mm -hmm. and every and I see every, what you're saying. every yeah. judge, right, had held that it was lawful, yeah. right. Internal process determined it was lawful, right? And and to the extent that to the extent that one court and a court that's an outlier, uh, to be clear, there's other courts that held the other way, um, uh, did hold the aspects of the program were illegal. And Congress, by the way, is responding to this, the revelations and their understanding of the program. Congress, of course, had been briefed that House and Judiciary Committee, House and Senate Judiciary and Intel Committees have been fully briefed on the program, as had the leadership. Now, whether they paid attention or not, debatable issue. No, but to be clear, Snowden didn't reveal illegality. Snowden didn't reveal waste, fraud, and abuse. Snowden didn't reveal anything about people using personal private office, pub, public office of private gain. So traitor, yes, whistleblower, no. All right, so hold, yeah, hold, because I want to get some other yeah. questions in here. I, I think it does raise a further question of what it is when you reveal something that at least may, it may not have been illegal, but many of us were completely horrified to find out that our government was doing that. Uh, and maybe that's a separate category, but I, I really do want to get other uh, voices in here, please. Thank you. My name is Connie Malone. I am a New York State retired high school English teacher. My question is to Bunny. When you signed the paper and wrote the caveat on top of your signature, were you aware at that time that Vice President Dick Cheney had ties to Hal Burton? I tell you, I didn't. Just turn, turn your... I did not know that. That I don't think it would have played in my decision anyway, but I did not. My, my brother is Elvin Hayes, the professional basketball player. He used to be here. And he wrote me on the morning that the story hit Houston and said, Bunny, you're on one side of the page and Cheney is on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> I did not know, you know, that Vice President Cheney had been uh, the CEO of Halliburton. So it wasn't anything, I, I, I've never been a political animal and I, I, I did not, it was nothing that had to do with the politics you know, and the election and all that that was going on at the time, because I was really kind of a dumb bunny on that. <laughs> you weren't dumb. You were just honest, and you yeah, found that, yourself. You were yeah. certainly not and, dumb. And and that's why that question you're just answering is that I like your answer that it's the law. You know, it's all about the rule of law, and that this that determines the far federal acquisition regulation. You know that. They, that's why they didn't, they said, she has to go. She's too much of a stickler for the rules. Yeah. Yep. But you can't play with those rules when you're dealing in the billions of dollars. You know, and then none of them, the lawyers, the, all of the other people, the generals, nobody could be punished, you know, for what I would have done. They would have just picked up the hotline if I had done what they wanted to do and, and their bunny greenhouse would have been, you know, so. 
it's it's the law. It 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 it's the rules. It's the law. It's the consciousness that and values that a person has when he's in a job that says, "I'm going to do the right thing for the right reason, regardless of the consequences." And those consequences are usually the loss of of top secret clearance. Mm -hmm. You know the the loss of your position. I was never one who cared about any power. I just wanted to do the right thing for the right reason. And I'm telling you, each of you out here are going to have your challenge somewhere in life. And you've got to make a decision. What's important, you know, for me to hide under um, the fact that I, I didn't have the courage to do the right thing for the right reason. I, I tell you, I reflect many times every day of walking down through the halls of the Corps of Engineers and people walking beside me looking straight ahead. Um, go get them, buddy. You know, but never looking toward me because they didn't want to be identified with me. Huh. It took SPS's wow. senior executive service had been chilled to the point where they say we don't want to be a bunny greenhouse. And and then some of them criticized me because they said, well, if you will leave now, you will keep your secret clearance. You will keep everything. You know, just go now. No, that wasn't good enough for me to abort my career and go now for whatever secret uh, plans that they had, agendas that they had over the truth. So if I had to sacrifice self for truth, I did what I had to do. Thank you. You effectively were a David versus Goliath. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, it, I, I, I look upon it as a calling. And I often thank God to say, I thank you for choosing me because it brought out of me some things that I may not have known were there, that I had the courage to stand up for truth. You placed me in a job that I didn't know all that you had planned out there, <laughs> you know, for me. I thought it was just to go in and revolutionize contracting in the Corps. <laughs> and, and, the, and in, in fact, the, all of the commanders and all didn't believe I could do it. And I was doing it inch by inch with a smiling face and going out and visiting them where nobody else had been going to the field. And I saw what was going on and I had an uh, open door, pol door policy where contractors and different people came in and told me what was going on. Mm -hmm. And so then it gave me something to move on. So to me, I was too much, I was too tall and, um, and that was a problem. You know, that she's tall and she's just overpowering and she's more powerful than the commander of the, the, the chief of engineers. I was not. It, that didn't matter to me. It mattered that uh, the business of contracting was done right. And I was writing all over the place. Every time I reviewed a document, I wrote all over it. And it was to tell the people in the field, I want this change. You know, this is not in accordance to law. Thank you. And that's what's so important about what you said. It's law. Mm -hmm. May I? Uh, I'm sorry. I, 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 let, let me go around, and if there's time, I'll come back. Uh, we're there at the very end. Um, hello. I, my name is Ryan Madsen. I'm an intern in the International Security Program. Um, I was just wondering how expediency can come into play between whistleblowing and leaking. As you said, whistleblowing is a process, but sometimes there are consequences when uh, information comes out too late. Um, so I was kind of wondering uh, if there have been examples of when whistleblowing came a little too late uh, and leaking would have been a better option in terms of the law, <laughs> or not the law, but consequences. David probably has a view. Yeah. <laughs> you wanna go first? Uh, sure. Uh, that's a great question, and I think it's really important here to, to bring up what it is that Edward Snowden actually revealed. Uh, and I think it's this, that emergency measures that have been put in place after 9-11, that were absolutely justified because we had just been attacked on U.S. soil, became business as usual, became standard operating procedure, and the American people had no idea that was going on. Arguably, that's something we need to know. And if we had known it sooner, 
who knows what the consequences would have been. A slightly different answer I would give, but I agree with everything that um, Allison has said here. So the whistleblower law applies beautifully in cases like Bunny, and we've Bunny's case here, and we've heard um, really great examples, uh, and and in Bunny's case, uh, really great courage in enforcing an existing law. But that isn't that doesn't take up the totality of issues that need to get debated inside the United States. Sometimes it's a legal issue, and if uh, Bunny flags the right thing, it then ends up going to the Justice Department or someone, and there's an investigation. In the case of the whistleblower whose transcript led to the transcript uh, released today, that person followed the procedures. It went to the Justice Department. The Justice Department said, we see no violation of the federal campaign finance law. Okay. Okay. And therefore, we are not going to prosecute. And this was just within the past couple of weeks. But when we look at that transcript, we're saying, wait a minute, there's something much bigger going on here. Mm -hmm. This isn't just a question of the narrow campaign finance law. We have to make a judgment about whether or not our president is actually trading a political favor for a foreign policy good, which is the campaign finance law doesn't take into effect. So frequently leaking happens when somebody either doesn't believe they're going to be protected by the whistleblower law, or they believe that the subject that they are leaking about is vitally important, but not covered by the whistleblower's law, right? So why do we write so much in the cyber realm, in the territory that you're doing here at New America, as some of which got reinforced, but only a tiny fraction of by the Snowden material. Why? Because we believe that the United States is using, we meaning New York Times, journalists who covered this, that the United States is using a new weapon that has tremendous power, that it has not debated at all how it wants to go use and what kind of restrictions should be on how we use it, and therefore what kind of standards there might be for how it's used against us. In the nuclear world, we actually had this debate much more thoroughly than we've ever had it in the cyber world, because we knew what nuclear weapons could do. We saw it in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and the government moved between the 1950s and the 1980s from saying nuclear weapons are just another bullet in the arsenal, to use a line that Eisenhower used, to nuclear, to nuclear weapons are something we would only really use as a matter of national survival. We've never had that fundamental debate in cyber. Most of what we hear about US cyber operations that we go and publish would not be covered by the whistleblower law, right? Somebody might say, we don't think we should be attacking power stations because it's going to make us more vulnerable. Well, that's an interesting debate that's worth happening, having, but certainly no one in the US government is violating the law in the course of doing it. And so we have to remember that whistleblowing and leaking are not necessarily about the same thing. Do you want to? Oh, yeah, what about opportunistic leaking? That is no way can be under the whistleblowing you know, act. Whereas the person or the community or whatever wants certain things to get out, but where they are can be anonymous you know, in do, getting that out. That, that happens every day, Bunny. And yeah. sometimes it happens at the White House where they will call you in and say, this is not for attribution, but X, Y. And, and you have to take that with the same amount of skepticism as you would take somebody who met you in a parking lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and look, look, I mean, I think, I think what David has highlighted is exactly right, right? There's a question about whether we should be having and, and how, how important this debate is about cyber. And I think you're right. It's a critical debate the nation needs to have. The question is, how do we come to that debate, right? Um, and you've, you've argued, I think, forcefully and, 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 and fairly that the way to come to that debate, because the government's been doing it for a while, is to have it out in the press and to talk about what's happening. And then Congress can think about it and debate it. And the public can talk about it and debate it. Um, but the hard part is you're exactly also right. It's not whistleblowing. It's not what Allison's talked about, right? It's not this, it's a debate over policy, 
and debates are a policy are important to have. But how we come to that debate is, 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 is important. It's not clear to me that where the government's doing something highly classified, legitimately and properly classified, right, appropriately, and there are debates about whether what we do in cyberspace should or shouldn't be classified and whether it has less of a deterrent effect if we classify everything, right? Those are good debates to have. But, you know, Edward Snowden reveals this, this phone records program. It's hotly debated, right? Amory says, you know, we were, people were horrified when they found out what was going on, and yet, the Obama administration continued that program in its identical form every day after Snowden revealed it for the better part of two years until Congress said change it. And when Congress said change it, Congress didn't say, oh, we're so worried about the violation of Americans' private civil liberties, shut it down. They just said put it in the hands of companies. So let's be real clear about Edward Snowden's claim. The NSA is violating your private civil liberties. It's a disaster for the country. I need to go out and leak it and then dump all this other stuff. And Congress' response was, yeah, but we're going to keep that thing alive. And the administration's response was, yeah, we're going to keep that thing alive. And at the end of the day, to this day, and maybe it ends at the end of this year, but to this day, that program remains. Maybe it's somebody else's hands. Hmm. But that same collection remains in place. Okay, we got one last question. And the, um, well, I, 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 <laughs> all right, two, we'll get, you, you will give them to you both at the same time, and then you all can close it out. Uh, so. Sure, and thanks. I haven't called on anybody on this side of the table. Uh, I'll be brief, Austin Adams, um, Open Technology Institute. Uh, do you see any issues uh, kind of uh, pivoting back to inspector generals and sort of the legitimate process for whistleblowing? Do you see any issues with the way that inspector generals are uh, political appointees rather than uh, insulated from partisan politics? And do you see any opportunities for reform on that front? OK, great. One question on inspector generals and partisanship, Elena. I'm Elena Soros. I'm a research associate with the Political Reform Program. I'm just curious um, over the history of whistleblowing that you've looked at and then the relationship with leaking, the way that in the last couple of years leaking in the White House has changed so much or the way that we're seeing it so frequently. Um, I'm curious if you're seeing a general pattern or what your predictions perhaps would be, although I know that's a tricky thing to ask about for the future of whistleblowing, and if you think that this is a new precedent that was set in, under the Trump administration because it's the Trump administration, or if that might be something that we see more of in the future. Great. All right. Else uh, first, just going with your question first, they're both great questions. I think it's really important to see what's happening currently with whistle, whistleblowing in its proper historical context. And so when you do when you do that, you really do get a sense, and I tried this is why I wrote the book, of how we've been in crazy situations before. Not quite as crazy as now, but it really looked grim on multiple occasions. And we managed to right the ship, get back on track. Typically the response is there's some kind of wild abuse, and then Congress legislates to meet that abuse. Then there's a workaround. And Congress has got to respond again. And so I think we're in one of those crazy moments now. And my hope is we'll get back on track and Congress will, res will respond. Social media may have changed that in some ways. I'm hoping that's not the case. With respect to the inspector generals, yes, this is a massive area for reform. Uh, they, they are not typically thought of as political appointees. Many of them now, if you look at uh, the data, are in acting positions. In fact, the, the ICIG right now the ICIG, the yeah, the intelligence uh, committee inspector community. general. Yes, yeah. welcome to Washington. Okay, <laughs> excuse me, excuse me. There's so many people revolving yeah. around that actually flip that. The director of national intelligence is acting, yeah. right? But if you look around the Trump administration, a lot of people are acting, and that has implications all of its own. That's also happened in the inspector general community too, and that's something we need to change because these are not partisan positions. The truth positions. It, you raised an important point. The whistleblowing comes from the bottom up. Inspector generals from the top down, right? Yeah. In other words, as as yet another way of holding people accountable. Yeah. And, and Anybody leaks, else? leaks come from the top, from, <laughs> yeah. from the top as well as the bottom. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. to give you to give you our the most delightful example of recent times, we have at various moments withheld information because the government has asked us not to reveal information that would give you the technical capability of our spy satellites right. around the world, and what their resolution is and so forth, because that would obviously help an adversary. 
And, you know, the average reader isn't going to know the difference between, you know, this resolution. So there's not a really much of a news value in it. So then three weeks ago, while we're all off trying to finish up our summer vacation, the President of the United States, sitting in his briefing, takes a cell phone photo of a highly classified photograph he has shown of an accident that happened on an Iranian missile launch pad, tweets it out. Overnight, a professor, I believe in France, sends his students working away on what the angle of the um, satellite must have been, because there are some unidentified satellites that we know to be spy satellites, what the distance was. We knew from Google Earth what the size of the launch pad was. And they do a bunch of calculations which immediately show you the precise resolution of what are one of our keyhole satellites, which are you know one of our most advanced satellites. And in conversations with the intelligence community later on, we have said to them, you know, don't expect to win the next time you ask us to hold back a piece of data that would reveal the resolution of satellites, because your chief, your your commander in chief just declassified that piece of data, mm -hmm. intentionally or not. And the location. Uh, yeah. Make him a traitor. But, Look, I think the, look, the president has the authority to declassify information Anything. if he wants to. He was fine. He's, he has, he's, he's entitled to do that. Yeah. It so may have been can, stupid, which it was. So it may have been, it may have been catastrophic for our national security, which it was. It, and he used it, by the way, to troll the Iranians, which is the most embarrassing yes. part of the whole thing. Like, it wasn't even substantive, right? And by the way, prior presidents have declassified highly sensitive signals intelligence, highly sensitive photographs. Kennedy okay. during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Kennedy during the Cuban Missile Crisis, and, and, and President Bush during the lead up to the Iraq War. Right. But they were very careful. They had the views of the intelligence community. They made the decision advisedly. They fuzzed up the pictures. Yeah. They, only, they only pulled out the specific tech cuts that were relevant to the conversation, right? And so, so the answer is yes, the president can do it. The president was authorized to do it. Should he have? Absolutely not. Was it, was it ridiculous? Of course it was ridiculous. And it revealed a lot about our capabilities beyond just the resolution. That's what's horribly disconcerting. Our enemies are watching. The Chinese and the Russians saw exactly what happened. It's outrageous, and to be fair, the president has not paid the price for doing that. In fact, people sort of think it's funny. It's not funny, it's ridiculous. Okay, so thank you. Uh, Bunny has to go teach a class, and we are at 1.30, and I'm, I, want, I know she's gotta get back in front of her class. Thank you all. I mean, we could, it was wonderful. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much.